Tradesmen built America. Not policymakers or desk jockeys, but hardworking blue collared men and women. Join me, Roger Wakefield, on conversations with some of the nation's most successful skilled laborers. This is the Trade Talks. What's it like to work with over a hundred men in the trades almost every day? The first word that comes to mind would be exciting. I would say that sometimes it can definitely turn into a, for lack of a better word, freak show, maybe. Um, (laughs) A lot of different personalities, a lot of men that have been doing what they've done in this industry for a lot of years. So they have very particular ways that they like to see things done. And it's my job to make sure that we can all come together as a team where they can get what they see fit completed while also working together as a team to make sure we all cohesively get to where we need to be. Now, what all different trades people do you work with? I work with HVAC, maintenance technicians, um, electrical wiring, so master electricians, master plumbers, and um, facility maintenance. And when you say technicians and masters and masters, that's the instructors. Yep. You've got people learning. Mm Mm-hmm. Facilities maintenance, electrical work, HVAC work, and now plumbing, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. We have students. We have about 30 students, I would say, in each trade. And they're all young men and women of all, not just young. We have some that are are older as well, but they're looking to start fresh. They're looking for new careers, and they're learning each one of those different trades. How long does it take somebody to learn the trades through your program? Seven weeks is what our programs are, and that is coming in green. So you come in green, and you leave our program after seven weeks, and you leave as a general technician. And you say a general technician. What can an HVAC person do that walks out of your training center? We train to have them leave as a entry-level service technician. So a little above an installer, above a maintenance tech. We like to say that when you graduate our program, you have about a year and a half to two years of experience in the field after our program. And you say above an installer, can they come out and be an installer? Absolutely. We have some people that choose to go that route, and that's just what the role was for that company that they got hired on, and they get on an installer truck, and they they can a lot of times run that truck right away. Look, I love HVAC just for that reason. From your program, you can bring people into a position where they're generating revenue. They're not just, hey, I'm paying you to sit and watch the journeyman every day and learn. They go through your program and they come out knowing how to do a whole bunch of things. We teach them the basics of what they need to know um, so that the contractors can form them into the type of technician they want to see. So we teach them no shortcuts, nothing, nothing along those lines but we teach them the knowledge they need to know to then grow into the technician they want to be. Um, so not only are they potentially running trucks a couple months after they graduate, but they're also, like you said, salesmen. So they can learn, they know the equipment, they know how to um, talk to customers because we don't just teach the trades, but we also teach soft skills. We teach how to communicate with customers, how to communicate with your boss and other um, employees within those companies as well because all of those are really important skills to know. I love that. You know, I was a plumber many, many years before I started learning new things. And once I did, communication was huge. Uh, I went through the Sandler sales training program and realized it's not sales. It's just communication. You're just talking to people. You're asking questions. You're listening and learning from that conversation, not just automatically thinking about your next answer. I think one of the smartest things I learned was listen to repeat. And if you listen to someone talk to you well enough, that you can repeat back what they said. So what I heard you say is you teach soft skills, you, you teach, you know, being on time, you teach showing up, you don't teach shortcuts, you teach the right way to do things. When you can communicate with somebody that way, they're like, wow, this, this person really got what I was talking about. So tell everybody who you are and what you do. My name is Megan Kendall, and I am the Deputy Director of Education at a trade school named Forge Now here in Dallas, Texas. Through your trade school, facilities maintenance, electrical, HVAC, and are you actually teaching plumbing now? I know y'all were getting ready to. Yep, we have ran um, one pilot plumbing class, and we are now in um, the fifth week of a plumbing class as well. 
I love that. Mm -hmm. So basically, each month, you graduate about 50 technicians. Yep, that's the goal. I mean, more than that, of course, is the goal, but I would say around 30 to 50 every month we graduate. So we are pushing um, technicians into the field in the DFW area and all over the country every single month. All around the country. So you don't just teach people from Dallas? No. Nope. One of our biggest populations is Army, excuse me, military. You bet. We have a lot of active military that come to us on the Skill Bridge or CSP programs. So it's in their, within their last 180 days of service. And those guys come from all over, all over the country, and they may go back to where they were stationed or they may choose to go somewhere else. Um, but it is not just in the DFW area we place nationally. I think veterans transitioning from active duty to civilian life, I've always said, guys, this is one of the most amazing opportunities you're ever going to get because they already come in disciplined. They're used to work. They're normally used to not taking shortcuts. They understand SOPs. And it's like, this is how we do it. This is why we do it. Let's get it done. People out of the military, really, this is the most amazing career opportunity for them no matter how long they were in. I mean, if they were in 20 years, great, they're 40 years old. If they were in four years, they're 24, but they've at least understood, hey, this is what it's like to do things the way you're supposed to do it. You come into a trade with that mindset and learn that you can make as much money as you want to make. It's huge. Absolutely. I mean, it offers them it offers them also a, a sense of community. You know, a lot of these military guys come out, they're used to having their brothers around them at all times. And to your point, they're also used to, they wake up at this time, they get dressed, they wear their uniform and they go to work. And this provides them a very similar feeling within the trades. They get to wake up, they put their uniform on and they have a truck of guys that they go run calls with. And those become like another community. So it helps that transition out. Um, I believe it, it really does help them transition into civilian life easier. Do you get more people from the military that, than you do just local contractors or local people wanting to learn? We are regulated by the TWC, so we have to have an 85-15 split with each cohort that we run. So um, we are allowed to have more. We are not allowed to have a certain number of military over civilians. We do have a very, very high population of, of military people coming into, coming into the trades, yeah. What's your graduation rate like? Our graduation rate right now is approximately 85 to 87%, um, and we're, we're very proud of that. We don't necessarily want a graduation rate of 100% because it means that probably something... Easy for anybody to get through. Yeah, you, you know. don't want to just write somebody off. We are 51% in the lab. So in order to graduate that last week, you have to show your instructor a list of practicals that you can complete with your hands. So even if you got A's every single week and you're working in the lab and you can crush written tests, if you cannot show our instructors that you can complete these tasks with your hands, you will not graduate our program because we are not going to let texts that are unsafe or do not know um, the proper techniques or, like I said, no shortcuts. They have to know what they're doing with their hands in order to graduate. Are most of your people local? I mean, do, do they drive home every night and come back every day? Or do they get housing here? Or how are, how are they set up? It depends. If they are local, they're able to stay at their house. Um, we do offer a lodging scholarship for anyone that is farther than 30 miles out of the DFW area. We offer a lodging scholarship. Um, which also creates kind of a community environment within our students. A lot of them do stay at the hotel so they can form study groups at night and do their homework together and give help and um, support each other through those seven weeks. A lot of times we see these classes come together and kind of like I was saying with the military, they form a brotherhood um, and a sisterhood, you know, for our, our couple females in the classes. But it really creates a sense of community for them. They have each other's backs and it makes the experience a lot easier for them. How did you get involved with the trade school? Tell me about you. Tell me about your background. I actually did go to a four-year college. Um, I was fortunate enough to use sports to get me to college. I played lacrosse at Penn State, and I majored in... Nittany Lions. Nittany Lions. We are. I majored in rehabilitation and human services and a minor in special education um, with a passion to go into the classroom for special education. I did that for about six years. 
And unfortunately, with the state of the education system in general, especially special ed. It's jacked up. It's very jacked up. I mean, just the entire education. I'm not even talking about special ed. All of it. Our education system in the United States is, it needs to be completely revamped. It's a concern to me that we're not screaming from the rooftops about this problem that we're, we're seeing. And it's really similar to the problem we see in the trades. Um, it's going to be a really, really serious problem in the next 10 to 20 years. We're going to see. We're going to see the fallout of us not doing what we need to do in the education system. So with that, unfortunately, it was, it was time for me to transition out of the classroom. I'm someone who's very passionate about what I do, and I need to be able to change things and enact change and see the product in front of me. And in the education system, it's not set up that way. There's red tape and there's no funding and you're just constantly met with barrier after barrier after barrier. And unfortunately, it was just something that I had to transition out of. And I was very fortunate enough to kind of stumble onto um, a relationship that I had um, with a, a local dad that I actually played lacrosse with his daughter. And he started Forge Now about four years ago. And I, funny enough, ran into his wife at a dog park when I was moving back to the Dallas area. So why and, Dallas? Why'd you move back to Dallas? So I'm originally from Dallas. I grew up in Dallas, Texas after Penn State. Oh, Highland Park. Highland Park. See? <laughs> you just have that attitude. <laughs> yes. It's not a bad thing. Uh, yeah. No, it's not. I was very fortunate, um, and it, it got me to where I was. So by no means, I mean, I'm proud of where I came from. It got me where I am. Um, and I think I have an interesting outlook on a lot of things as well. After college, I moved to Florida, where I taught for about six years. I ended up getting pregnant with my husband and needed to move back home with my family. So um, I wanted to move back with mom and dad and, and be around my support system. So we packed up everything and, and got on the road and headed back to Dallas. And that's when I was in the transition period and ended up at a dog park with my mom in the morning. And um, one of our, our CEO's wife said, you know, my, my husband has this trade school. I don't really know what you could do. But I know that with your education background, you could do something. You could help. Why don't you just just go talk to him? Um, and I'll admit, I was definitely hesitant and just kind of thinking to myself, what am I going to do in a trade school? Right. I don't know anything about the trades other than working with my dad my whole life with my hands. And, you know, I, I did. I love fixing things. I love tinkering. I love tools. We fix old cars. So I, I have that background in me, but by no means did I ever think of entering the trade school. Um, I did know that I needed, I didn't want to transition back into a classroom setting. I wanted to go into something different. So I took a chance and went to Forge Now, sat down and, and interviewed and accepted the job on the spot. This video is sponsored by Leak Pro. Go check out leak-pro.com. So you talked about 10 to 20 years, we're going to realize it if we don't change our education system. What if we don't? change the trades? We're going to have a really big problem on our hands. The infrastructure that we are, we're lacking with, um, within the trades is, it's something that we're not going to be able to sustain. Um, we're not going to have people to fix these issues. And something that we're really passionate about is our trades, when we graduate these graduates, we tell them, you're first responders. I have a one-year-old daughter. When my heat goes out in the middle of a snowstorm, it is a life or death situation. I have to have heat in order to protect my child. So that HVAC maintenance tech that's coming in to fix my system is a first responder. It's life or death. And we have not processed what that's going to look like when there's no one to come to your house to fix that. We have been very fortunate to have that at our disposal. You call your company that you've had and you call the tech and, and they may not be able to show up that day, but they're going to get yeah. there. You know, they're going to get there within two days, two, three days, mm -hmm. most likely within a day or two, especially if you have a child, they're going to make that call within that 24 hour window, 24 to 48. And if that company can't, you can call the next one. There's going to be something within the next 10 to 20 years where you are going to call and there won't be anyone to answer. During the freeze, I had a service manager that literally he lived a little further out, but he called all the other plumbers before calling me and says, hey, the roads are bad. They're dangerous. If you get out, you're going to die. 
And then they calls in to say, look, I've already talked to plumbers. We're not going to be able to make it. I'm like, guys, pops, people's pops are freezing. You understand that they need plumbers now more than ever. Yeah, but we don't want to put our lives at risk. I think we were the only plumbing company that did not get out and work. And I was out personally running calls, trying to take care of people. So, you know, it blows my mind that a lot more people don't understand, look, this can be an emergency and you've got a professional license in your pocket to take care of people. I love that y'all are teaching them that, you know, look, you are a first responder. I think that a lot of blue collar people figured out that, look, the trades are essential people and, and we need that. What is it you love now about teaching the trades or being involved with it? I have a background with special education and disability. I have um, family members that have. And trades people are special. <laughs> they are. I, I get it. I get it. They are. You, you know, it's funny, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but one thing that I teach trades people, and I do, I, I, think, I think trades people are very special. Here's a problem with trades people. The day we get a license in our pocket, most of us quit learning. I got in the trades to become a plumber. The day I got a plumbing license, I quit learning. It's like, look, just let me go to work. I'm a plumber. It's what I am. It's what I do. It's what I are. And down the road, I started learning again and started growing and started getting better opportunities and started making more money and started learning again and started making more money. And it's like, wow, it's kind of funny how all this ties together. But it's, it's so important, I think, that, that trades people understand, look, never freaking stop learning. Sorry. Good. No. Go ahead. I, I saw an opportunity to climb up on my soapbox. So I love it. And you're right. It's too easy to get that license and say, okay, that was my, you know, that was my end goal. I'm right? a professional. I'm a professional. I did it. And I think that ties back to what are your, what are your dreams? What do you aspire to be? What are you wanting for yourself? What's your why? Is your why to just get that TDLR license that says you're a master plumber? Okay. Well, plumbers, thank God, are through the Texas State Board of Plumbing. I apologize. You're they correct. They tried putting us under TDLR, but thanks, Chris, that didn't happen. Uh, well, we had to throw a rally down at the Capitol to fight it and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We ain't doing that. Mm -hmm. I, I do. Our plumbing is the one course that we have that goes through the, the plumbers union instead of TDLR. Chris Patty, one guy from Marshall, Texas, almost screwed up the entire state of Texas. I hate to say it. He really did. Well, thank, anyway. God, thank God it didn't happen. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, but yes, thank your you, Governor Abbott. <laughs> it, it definitely, it is. It's too easy to do that. But that's what we, we really try to teach them that, you know, you're only learning the basics here and there's always room to grow. Our instructors tell them, I learn every day. You know, I'm going to teach you guys, but you may teach me something too. There is, you're never going to know everything. It's impossible. There's always going to be something to learn. And knowledge is power. Knowledge is the one thing that no one can take from you. Our president gives a, a speech at our graduation and he says it perfectly. You know, they can take a house, they can take a car, they can take things from you. They can't take knowledge from you though. So if you choose to, learn every day, the opportunities are endless. What I love most about the trades and teaching and being immersed in it is that back to where I was saying that my past, I have, you know, family members with intellectual disabilities. So early on, I saw that a traditional education didn't fit for them. That traditional school of 30 students where you just need to sit down and shut up and listen to a teacher go on and on. So it's kind of like a job. Show up, shut up, <laughs> do what your boss says. What are we training people for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, that setting sometimes doesn't work for people. Sometimes you're not, you need other avenues to learn. And what I realized when I made this transition is that the trades offers that. I was... I was definitely, I was step stated leaving the classroom. That's my passion. I love teaching people in a different way. I love thinking outside of the box. How am I going to go about this differently to help someone learn that might not learn this way? Okay, if you didn't get it that time, let me try a different time. What about that? And you keep going and you keep going. And what I quickly realized in the trades was I look at our orientation and I see the guy standing in the back of the classroom that needs to stand up, the fidgeting, the, the spacing out. If we don't have visual, you know, I see all of it. I see people that 
the traditional setting didn't work for them. Four years of college is not the path for everyone. You do not need to sit in a classroom to be successful. And a lot of times written to, I was terrible in school. I was a bad test taker. I have ADHD and that did not work for me. I want to be with my hands. I want to be in it. I need to see it. I need, I'm a kinesthetic learner and a visual learner. And my favorite part about being involved in the trades and the trade school specifically is watching these guys finally have an avenue that works for them. Of course, those first couple of weeks of school, you know, you're nervous and you're, oh, and, and there is written tests. We're school. So we do have homework and we do have written tests. But once they see, oh, it all transitions right into hands-on work, yeah. it's a light bulb for these guys. And they finally have something where they feel confident about what they're doing. And to me, that's the best thing that anybody could give me. I just love to see them succeed. So, so let's talk about the school. First two weeks, you said predominantly classroom. What do they learn? Because I would assume they're mostly the first two weeks, they're all learning a lot of the same things. Safety. Yep, safety. Attitude. So, soft absolutely. skills. The first two weeks are all safety. We start each course. Um, of course, each program has something different. HVAC is Nate Ready to Work and EPA, and then electrical, plumbing, facilities, OSHA 10. So those first couple weeks, depending on which trade you choose, is all safety. That is our number one priority. Before you enter our lab, you have to prove that you know how to be safe. And that's absolutely the number one priority. After that, um, and you are, you're, you're learning here and there. Obviously, we're going on a ladder. You're seeing the basics in the lab. You're walking through, getting your hands on a couple things. But it's mostly classroom work to make sure that you're prepared to go out into that lab. And then they transition more into specifically the trade knowledge, depending on which course you're taking. Then they get out in the shop and start actually getting to work on equipment, on fixtures, on whatever it is. How does the mindset mindset shift for them? I mean, can you see it? Because, you know, to me, I, I'm in a classroom. I'm like, okay, my, my eyes are rolling back in my head. I'm bored to tears. I'm trying to stay focused. But when I walk into a lab, into a shop, I'm like, okay, here we go. How's their attitude change? Because it's got to be just like, here we go. I get to do it now. It Absolutely. Once they get, um, all of our students get um, a tool bag as well. So the light bulb definitely comes on when they see those tools. They get to, oh, I'm really going to be using this. Okay, I get to learn all these new tools. Some people have never seen some of the tools that they're provided. So that's the first kind of, okay, they got some smiles on their face. They're getting excited about what they're going to start doing. The first, I would say, couple weeks when they're in the lab, they're more comfortable than the classroom, but still the nerves. Can I do this? A lot of my students will tell me, I've never completed anything in my life. I've never graduated from anything. I have never been, quote unquote, successful in something along these lines, especially in the education system. So there's nervous. They have not had that pass to show them, hey, you can do it. But by weeks three and four, I always say are my favorite weeks, things click and their heads start getting held a little higher. They have smiles on their face walking around. They're helping their classmates. They're helping the freshman class once they come on campus. And it is night and day once they hit that third or fourth week. And it's like, let's go, baby. I'm on. Okay, so weeks five, six, and seven. I'm assuming weeks two, weeks three and four, they're really, that's where they're learning. Here's how you do this. 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 Weeks five, six, and seven, I'm assuming is when they're, here's my list of things chores that I've got to have done. Let me show you I can do this. Let me show you I can do this. Let me show you I can do this. Do they do that predominantly on their own? Is it structure led? I mean, I know there's got to be an instructor, but I mean, are they pretty much in there practicing everything they learned in weeks three and four? How, how's that go? So it's structured where three and four, they're learning a lot of the basics that's going to allow them to go and complete things, not on their own, but on their own with supervision, of course. So in education, I like to say the best way to teach somebody something is I do as my instructor, right? So weeks three to four, I'm telling you 
this is what a condenser unit is. This is what a recovery system is. This is how you set up your gauges. Now, did you know what all that was before you got in here? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so I, as the instructor, am doing it, or I am showing you. Then we do. So we, together as a class, maybe go get our hands on that recovery system, on the condensing unit, or on the switch that we're wiring in electrical. Then the next step is you do. So now in three or four, now that I've showed you, now that we've done it together as a class or in groups, now you go do it. So now I'm going to go tell you, hey, go install this system. Our students in HVAC do a full install and a full teardown. Of course, we have lab techs and instructors supervising, asking questions, answering questions, um, making sure everybody's safe, but they're doing predominantly all of the work themselves. So three, four, five, six, seven, now they're ready to graduate. I love the fact, and, and I, I know you kind of briefly mentioned it, they're in uniform every day. You give them uniforms as part of not just uniforms, boots, uniforms, pants, shirts, whole nine yards. Utility belt, boots, everything, and tool bag. They're ready to graduate and get right into the field. And, and they get their tool bag after week two, I guess. Between weeks one and two, they get their full okay. tool set, yep. So that that's, that builds the excitement back up. Mm-hmm. The, the, and this is so good because now they understand that uniform is part of my job. It's part of what I do each and every day. I've been to graduation. Graduation's cool. To see the excitement on these, and, and I'm going to say young men's, but, but it's young men and women. Mm-hmm. How, what percentage of students do you get through that are female? I would say that we have about one to two females in every starting cohort, but that's including all all four of our programs. We def- So four to eight per month, really? Four to eight per month, I would say. Probably more closer to the four side. Um, it's, it's, and hence, it's a population that we're looking to get, um, especially in the, more, the residential settings. Um, a lot of what we discuss when we talk about those soft skills, you know, we have to teach them, look, who's typically home in a setting when the HVAC goes out or when you need something wired or the plumbing it is typically a female it's Mm -hmm. typically the female of the house that is home accepting that call it's your job to make sure she feels safe enough to let you come into your house her house right that is why females in this industry are so vital because in a residential setting it makes a lot it make it can make a world of a difference to have a female tech show up and, you know, maybe that woman has a history of men. You never know what you're going to walk into. And females, we have just not cracked this industry like we, like we should. And it's sad. Oh, I mean, it's really sad, especially plumbing. And because that's the one I'm more familiar with, the top plumber in Texas is a female, Lisa Hill, amazing person. One of the former chief plumbing inspectors in Dallas, Diane Villarreal. Female. It's incredible. Mary Conger from Conger Construction, master plumber, mechanical engineer, continuing education provider, master plumber. And the funny thing is, and, and I'm lucky enough, I've got every plumbing endorsement Texas has. So I'm master med gas, master water supply protection specialist, master multi purpose residential fire protection systems. So are Diane. So is Mary. So is Lisa. Women have an opportunity to move up really, really good. And I hate to say this, guys. I think it's because women work smarter, not harder. <laughs> but but I do. I, I think that they look at it completely different. The more I learn, the better I get, the higher I move up. Men just come in it's like, get out of my way. I got this. I'm going to grunt it in. Okay. And I think that is what women can offer in the trades. We do work well together. Men and women are different. You know, it, it's, it's a fact. And if we can start working together, right, with that, this is just how I do it, and they can maybe, we can bring more women in to say, well, hold on, absolutely, that might work, and that might have worked for you for 20 years. But let's brainstorm for five minutes about maybe a different way or maybe one or two ways that we could make it even better, more efficient, faster? Or have you ever thought of this? 
And with that collaboration, the possibilities are endless. If you're enjoying the Trade Talks, hit that subscribe or follow button, which helps us produce this awesome blue-collar content absolutely free. And now, back to the episode. How do we get more women in the trades? Kind of all comes back to not just women, but men as well. Transforming and elevating the trades through education, innovation, and community engagement. That's a quote sitting right behind you. You're still in my quote. I stole your quote. I think it's about showing people what the trades really are. I want to bang my head against the wall every time I hear somebody say, well, just call the tech. Oh, and they think that these tradesmen are, for lack of a better word, dumb. And they're, oh, well, they're just going to come fix my plumbing. When you sit down with a tradesman and you pick their brain for what they actually know, your mind's going to be blown. But people aren't taking the time to do that. And, and maybe that's why women, women haven't, you know, we haven't cracked open the egg yet. We haven't, the trades has not elevated yet to see, okay, there's a lot more than just grungy old men going to fix an HVAC system. These guys are brilliant. Plumber, you're brilliant. I mean, I sit down and I get a 10 minute talk from my master electrician. I'm like, what are you taught? What are you saying? We divide by the square root of three because of the three phase and the two phase. And my jaw is at the floor because I can't believe how smart these guys are. And we, it's just what we do. It, and it's second nature. I mean, you guys can just talk and talk and talk about this stuff. And it's such incredible knowledge to have because you're enacting change. You can fix things. And it's not just with your hands. It is in your head, too. You know, of course it is. You have to know how to do it. We say it's hands-on, it's hands-on. Well, what controls your hands? Your head, your brain. So the knowledge that you have to have in order to go and, and do these jobs is in, it's invaluable. But, but Megan, the funny thing is, it's not hard to learn. You know, I, I tell people, people are like, oh my God, I can't get into plumbing because I'm not good at math. Yeah, you'll figure it out. You will figure it out because it makes your life easier to figure it out. Anything that we want to do in life, we can do. You know, when people tell me, I can't learn that. No, you've been listening to the wrong people because I'm telling you, you can't. And that's, I think, part of the problem in the world today. We, we tell kids, and, and, I, and I hate this, and, and it's just, it's the world we live in. If you don't go to college, you're never going to amount to anything. And when I was young, I heard that all the time. I've talked to so many tradespeople. They've been told that their whole life. And I think that tradespeople actually believe, look, I didn't go to college. I, I'm not anything. You've heard me talk. I'm just a plumber. Okay. But I'll use it a little bit different. I understand the, the meaning behind the words. But a lot of people think, oh, you're a plumber. Mm, I feel so sorry for you. Yeah. You're a plumber. Bless your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh-uh. No. And, and I, used to, I used to have a thing on my Facebook page that underestimate me. This will be fun. <laughs> Because, I mean, people do. They, they think you're stupid. And it's funny because people are like talking about how much plumbers charge. You, we were just talking about how I would fix a leak under a slab. And you're like, wait, what? You're going to dig a hole and tunnel all the way over here and, 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 and all this? And it's like, yeah, but I do it safely. Mm -hmm. I've got professional dig crews that I don't crawl in a ditch that I'm worried about. Of course. And... You know, you, you hear about plumbers dying in Texas. Well, you know, uh, another trench collapsed on a plumber or, or cave fell in on him. They don't dig them right. Plumbers trying to save money. I'll just dig this myself, which I don't know why a plumber would ever dig. <laughs> Not like that anyway. But my whole thought is anybody can get in and learn the trades. If you can learn to ride a bicycle, you can learn to tie your shoes, you can remember how to walk to school, the same place each and every day, you can learn anything in plumbing. I truthfully believe that. I do too. I believe you can do anything you put your mind to. Where do the people that graduate your program, where do they end up going to work? So a lot of them work right now, the four um, programs that we offer are residential. So they're going to work for residential contractors, either residential wiring, residential HVAC maintenance, residential plumbing, or facility maintenance. 
Um, facility maintenance, of course, is more apartment buildings, mm-hmm. but still residential. And like I said, it's local contractors, but also all over the country. Um, and we do have some guys that enter the commercial space or are fortunate enough to enter a company where they start off residential and they're able to um, build that, build on that knowledge and end up going into the commercial route. It's something that we're going to build on as well at Forge Now. We want to keep the four trades that we have, but build. So residential, then commercial, and then industrial and, and keep going up from there and just provide more knowledge and more opportunity for our students. How many instructors do y'all have per infinity, so what, what I call them? Right now we have four electrical instructors. We have five HVAC instructors, two facilities, and two plumbing instructors. And then we also have lab technicians that support those instructors within um, the classroom and the lab. Um, so they're not official, quote-unquote, instructors. We offer a lot of support in order to bring them up to that level if they so choose. So if they, if any of our lab technicians have interest in becoming a instructor, we provide the training and the opportunity to get them there. You've probably got one or two instructors per 15 people or 20 people, something like that. So our ratio in the classroom is 1 to 30, and then our ratio in the lab is 1 to 20. And we have to follow that per TWC, um, you know, and for safety regulations. So... That's why we do have a lab technician um, with every classroom so that we can make sure to follow those ratios. And, of course, it's better for the students. Absolutely. Lower ratio is better, no matter what anyone wants to say. A teacher teaching 30 students is not going to be as productive as a teacher teaching 10 or 15. So for us, those are our standards, 30 to 1 and um, 20 to 1. But we really try to go above and beyond that because, like I said, it's... We don't want to just fall into the traditional setting. We don't want to fall into, well, what is the education minimum, right? Because we, right, like right. we said, yeah, let's not base everything on minimums. It's yeah. trash, and you know, it's what's going to get you by. How can we make that better? A, a group of three to five students learning with an instructor or a lab tech is going to get them so much farther in such a shorter amount of time than a group of twenty people where half of them can't see and. They're whispering in the back because now we've lost their interest and it's, it's just not as productive. Tell me about Forge now. Who started it and what was the idea? What was the concept? Where did it come from? Our two co-founders, Marvin Key and Rob Holmes, started the company in 2018. They started training in 2020. So we did get a And the trades became even more important. We got permission um, from the state to train in person because we petition that we're training first responders. So they actually did get approval to continue to train in person in COVID. Of course, we followed all the guidelines. You bet. We got to. You know, we have to. But it was, I tell people every day in Texas, we didn't wear masks. (laughs) There's certain times we had to. Of course. Um, But it, it, of course, slowed us down a little bit as COVID did for everybody. Their initial idea, though, was that They saw the infrastructure. They saw the hole in the infrastructure in America. We're going to run into a big problem soon. So what are we going to do about it? They went out and spoke with local contractors. What do you want to see in a technician? What do they need to know? What do you hate about the current trade schools? What do you like about them? And they did all the research they could. What they came back to find is a lot of these trade school options, they're either nine months or two years. They're, They're half days. They're um, you know, their night programs, which totally we understand people have to work. They have to provide for their families. They, are y'all teaching night programs yet? We, not yet. Okay. We are structured from 7 to 4 p.m. So that is how we're able to do it in seven weeks. It's because it's a full-time, full you bet. No, no, I get it. That was the idea. Look, we don't have two years to wait. We are struggling now and we need tradesmen right now, how can we train them in the shortest amount of time possible, but effective and safe and get them out to these contractors? So they um, they met with Leon Young, our director of technical training, and they got to work writing curriculum. What do we need out of these technicians? And they wrote programs for seven weeks. Originally, actually, our programs were eight weeks, and then we transitioned them to seven. And they first started with HVAC and electrical, and then within the last year, we've added on facilities and plumbing as well. Can we do it faster than seven weeks? 
And I'm asking because, look, I, I see what's coming. Yeah. Okay. Here's why kids, and I say kids, you're right, every age. I, when I was an instructor in the union, I had a student that was 55 years old. Okay. So it, it's not just kids. It's not. I'm 60. I do too. Even he's a kid <laughs> to me. Even yeah. he's a kid to me these days. <laughs> This is why more people don't get in the trades. They cannot get in and make decent money from the get-go. Question number one, can we shorten the process? Can, can, we, can we look at a seven-week syllabus and say, hey, we could probably do this in six. We, we could possibly do it in five. Five, five may be a little tough, but, but again, my mind's just running because I, I'm listening to this thinking, okay, if we can shorten this down from four years, because I truthfully think, to be honest, I think you give me the right person, and, and it would have to be the right person. So all you that are fixing to leave comments about this, and anytime you want to say something directly to a camera, that's your camera. Just oh. look it right dead in the okay. lens and say, hey, <laughs> I know a lot of y'all are fixing to leave comments and tell me, Roger, you're nuts. It's impossible. I truthfully think that I could take someone in, and I've said before six weeks, you give me six weeks hands-on with a person that wants to learn, I can teach them to pass the plumbing exam. Not just pass the exam, but do the stuff that needs to be done. Now, you're not teaching for the exam. You're teaching how to change a toilet, how to repair a toilet, how to set a water heater, how to change a lavatory, a kitchen sink, a garbage disposal. There's a million things there, but you give me six weeks, I can train someone to teach that well enough. They could pass the tradesman exam. I know that's a book exam, so it's different. But even the practicals based on commercial, but you give me six weeks with somebody, I can put them in a van where they can walk into 90% of the houses that we get calls for and take care of the problem. This is a very hot topic within, I think, not just for now specifically, but all trade schools. And what I'm finding is that I get different answers from different contractors. It, I get contractors that tell me there's no way we can't shorten it. Seven weeks is the absolute minimum. And I get people that say, mm, I could do it in five to six. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's all about the student that you're teaching. Because, of course, in a school, you know, in a class of 30, we're going to have some people that might not be as involved, immersed. They might not be as hardworking as others. But then again, you've also got some students that after that sixth week, he's like, look, I've already got all my stuff done. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. That's very true. Okay. You know, I did it. I, I'm done. Kind of hands off. I can help other people now. Yes. Y you bet. Exactly. I like that. So, and we definitely utilize that. There's students that we see within three or four that are already like, okay, this clicked within three to four weeks. And of course, they might, they haven't learned all of it, but they're already helping their classmates. They already, it, it clicked and they're helping. And we all know that the best way to learn something is by teaching. Oh, yeah. So we, we absolutely push our students to help when they can. Um, now, back to your question. Do I believe that if you could vet your students and vet your population to make sure you're getting students, kids, adults that are going to want to grind and work as hard as possible, that have the ability to do that, that have the, um, the attention span? You know, seven, five weeks is still five weeks you to bet. stay in to stay in learning mode, in learning mode all day, every day. It's hard. I get it. It's, I, it's so hard. hard. I sat through a six day conference week before last and day six, my brain was jello and I'm just like, and I'm learning a lot of stuff that I know, but a lot of new stuff. And I'm just like, at the end, I'm like, I, I don't even know what to write now. It, it, it can be very overwhelming and it can be draining, but if you have the work ethic and the ability to get yourself back to a good place every day and you have ways to pull yourself back in and take Brit and you can figure that out, I think it could be done. Now, I can't speak for all four trades across the board, but I think it could probably be done in five to six weeks. But um, again, you, it, it's all about the student population that you're going to bring in. No, I, and, and I agree. And I guess I'm thinking, look, I'm, I'm a go-getter. Um, I'm like, Mr. All in, you know, 90 miles an hour or I don't play. And I guess it, it is smarter to leave it at seven weeks. And you said, y'all cut that down from eight, leave it at seven weeks and say, look, we can get 90% of the people to get all this complete in this amount of time. 
yeah, we can, the people that learned it a little faster or the people that, you know, picked up on it within five to six weeks, they have those two extra weeks to, again, learn it even more, teaching it, and and then it's just really ingrained in their brains. You bet. Then the people that didn't, they have those two extra weeks to receive a little more help to make sure that they're prepared by that seventh week to walk across the stage and, and ace those practicals. So it it gives everybody a bit of a benefit, whether you're just reteaching it or you have a little bit of cushion to make sure, okay, I got to make sure this clicks. Let me just run this one more time. And it allows for both of those populations of students to succeed. What gets you excited when you wake up every day? Back to your first question, I would say what gets me excited every day to go to work is that I get to work with, you know, 100 tradesmen every day. They really do. They keep me on my toes. Every day is something different. There's a different problem there or not necessarily problem, but there's something that we have to tackle. There's a student that's struggling. Well, how are we going to get through to him? There's a student that's excelling. Hey, how can we offer him more education? How can we make sure that he's not settling and how can we provide him more while he's here with us? Um, equipment's broken. We got to fix this. It it just every day is something different. And that really is what is so exciting about what we do, I think. The kids that graduate your program, what kind of money are they starting out at when they walk into these companies? Do, do y'all follow up with that and check on that? So um, it varies within trades, um, but I would say the average hourly wage is anywhere from 18 to 23 an hour. Um, like I said, electrician, HVAC facility, they're all a little different, um, but de- within that range of 18 to 23. I've seen 25 right off, right out of the bat, but that's guys that maybe were from the military and had prior experience in the trade, so they, they have some more experience bringing to the table. But what we tell our students always is um, one of my instructors actually just recently told me he likes to call this um, generation the microwave generation. It's immediate. It's right now. Immediate gratification. You bet. And we really try to tell them no company should pay you 25 to 30 an hour right when they graduate before you've proven to them that you're a 25 to 30 hour employee. It doesn't make sense. You have to put in the work to get that money. And it will come. It may come in 30 days. If you get out there and you prove them, hey, I'm going to work my tail off. You bet. And I'm going to prove to you that I'm willing to learn more. I'm willing to help. I'm willing to do all above and beyond. Your butt's going to be making 25 to 30 an hour pretty quick. And, and, and I'll teach you a trick. I had, I had Gus from Milestone Electric mm-hmm. in a few weeks back. And we were talking about the interview process. He said, Roger, I'll tell you right now, somebody walks in in a suit, they get $2 an hour more right then. I said, really? Because I tell people, don't walk in in a suit. Come in in your work clothes, but look like you're ready to go to work. He said, Roger, I'm just telling you, if they wear a suit in my office, they came in to impress me. He said, and they have. He said, I will give them $2 an hour more just for getting up and taking the time to put a suit on. And I'm like, wow, something to think about. Because I'm like, I don't want anybody you to walk in with a suit. You bet. Well. You bet. So that's really too. something that I've got to kind of sit back and read. Yeah, you, you need to go back and watch my live stream with Gus Santos in it. Because he's like, Roger, I'm telling you, I will pay $2 an hour more because that person cared enough to get up to impress me. That is really good to know. Milestone's hired some of our graduates, yep. too. So I, I hope maybe. they wore a suit in because if so, they got $2 <laughs> an hour more. Something well, for you to remember. It's something for me to if remember. If you interview at Milestone. Wear a suit. Wear a suit. I'm going to make sure it's going to be worth it. my students that our placement coordinator is going to have to start rethinking what we teach them. That's really interesting. It it is because I tell them just the opposite. Don't you wear a suit? Because I'm like, no, dude, you're coming here to work. Now, what would you do if you were contract? If you were a contractor and someone walked in in a suit, would you feel the same way? And have to see how the interview went. Is the suit putting lipstick on a pig? Mm Mm-hmm. Good point. Or is the suit, this young person here is trying to impress me. I agree. I think it depends on the candidate. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I'd i be curious to actually poll, you know, 200 contractors to see if it would deter them from hiring someone or would it incentivize them to pay them more? Because I think it could go either way. You're right. I, I see it. it when, when Gus worded it that way, I thought, 
you know what? It makes sense. You, and that is, right? The interview process is you want to impress. You mm-hmm. want to make them feel special. You want that. Oh, I teach that. So, I mean, when I'm teaching people how to get in the trades, one of the first things that I teach is, or not really the first, but it's in that first section, how to impress them, Mm -hmm. how to guarantee you get the job. And you're right. Showing up in a suit shows them, wow, you took an extra, you took an extra 10 minutes today. And even if you walk in and say, look, I normally don't dress like this, Mm -hmm. but this is a job I'm interested in. I'd be like, wow. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. But I do think the other half of that is some contractors would see someone walk through that door in a suit and go, yeah, send them write them right off. Yeah, send them home. That, that, that will never work here. But if we dive deeper, stick with me here. Why? Why would a contractor be so hesitant to write someone off in a suit? Is it because they don't, they have, you know, a hidden... Oh, yeah, you know of, they do. I'm not good enough, and you think you're better than me, and I don't want that in my office. I don't know if it'd go that far, maybe. You know, I, I, th- I think a lot of the, these contractors put on suits every Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. So I don't see it like that. When I first thought about the suit, it's like, look, you're not applying for an office job. Right. My thought. You're not applying to be the general manager. You're not applying to be the president. You're applying to be a plumber, and plumbers don't dress like that. Mm-hmm. That's the way I see it. But when Gus said that, I'm like, wow, you know what? I got I to gotta rethink this. And I think, I guess that it's, it might not necessarily be that, to your point, that it's better, but I think it's, it shows that divide that we were talking about between how people look at the trades versus how people look at everything else. We, our society has put such a division between the two. It's either you're a grungy HVAC plumber, tech facility, electrical Butt wiring, showing n- dirty fingernails, and I just don't care, or you're a suit in a corporate setting and you're a sellout because you sit behind a desk. You bet. And why can't we be both? Why can't? And I kind of see it as a sellout. The suit <laughs> sitting behind the desk, I'm just going to tell you. I. Uh, it's never a job I wanted. No, I never. My instructors tell me every day, Megan, I would hate to have your job. I do not want to sit at a computer. I don't want to be doing any of that. You couldn't pay me all the money in the world. And yeah. I respect it. And you see where I sit all day. <laughs> I know. It's, it's funny how life changes. There's a happy medium in yes, everything. Indeed. So this has been fun. I, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Me too. Not near as hard as you thought, was it? <laughs> no. No. I know that you're not sitting here like this anymore. No. You relax a little bit. <laughs> you're you're, you're, you're bit, talking yes. with your hands. <laughs> if you could go back to the day Megan walked out of the house in Highland Park to get ready to go to college, or just say the day Megan walked out the day after she graduated. High school. Mm-hmm. You woke up the next day, you walk out the door trying to go figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. And you could stand there today and talk to little Megan. What would you tell that Megan based on everything you know now? This video is sponsored by Leak Pro. Go check out leak-pro.com. I would never tell her to not go to college because I do value a lot of what I learned, not necessarily the education part of it, but what I learned about life and the friendships I made there. But I would tell her that that's not going to be the end all be all. And there is a whole lot to this world that you don't know yet, that you haven't seen. And the opportunities are endless. I really do believe that God put me in this path for a reason. I think it it does, to your point. You know, being with 100 contractors every day, it it does take a special type of personality to manage that, right? To relate to these guys and not to, you know, put myself, (laughs) I want to stay humble, but I do I do do it well, I feel like. I really relate to them because I respect them and I think they are smart men who know what they're doing. And I also like to have fun. I like to do stuff with my hands. 
And I think that it's such an amazing opportunity that I would have told her, maybe get into it a little sooner um, and start to just talk to people and ask questions and open your mind to different avenues that you never would have thought would be possible. I never would have told her, you're going to end up at a trade school with 100 contractors and not be teaching children with autism in a classroom. I mean, it's polar opposite worlds, right? I'm a a teacher at the front with a smile on my face. Good job, Johnny, you know, and and I loved every second of that. But me now, as a director of education in the trades, I'm the same person, but it's different. And it's an amazing opportunity that I've been provided. I feel special to be a part of the trades. I really do. You know, it's a lot different because the first time I saw you, you were on stage screaming and yelling at people to try to make graduation happen. And it wasn't, hey, Tiny, I need you to do this. <laughs> it's like, hey, get your now. I don't care. Go. Absolutely. And I'm like, oh, my God, I like this girl. Mm-hmm. And I think, and maybe this is a part of where maybe women can realize that this is kind of an avenue that we can start to get into. The reason that I can be that, Megan, the reason that I can yell and be stern with not only my students, but with my instructors, right? I have instructors that are 55 years old under me that I have to, you know, work with. And, and you're manage. what, 22? I'm, God, Roger, 30. I'm 30. Um, but you have to build a relationship with these men and with these people. And all it really takes is that you show them you respect them. And then they're going to respect you right back. Mm-hmm. And you can be stern and you can tell them, hey, look, cut it out. We need to get to work. And they're going to know and trust you enough to know that you mean it because you have their back. And that's all that really you need to show trades guys is that you're loyal and that you respect them. You know, and, and anything. And, you know, don't get me wrong. She was screaming and yelling at people up there, but it was not in a disrespectful way. Mm-hmm. You had already been with these people for seven weeks. Yep. You've built relationships with them. They know you. They know that it comes from the heart, that it's good. And no, it was neat because I was watching you up there. And I mean, the way people listen to you and yes, ma'am. And okay. And yada, yada, yada. And no, you, you, you do. You're very good at what you do. Well, I appreciate that. I feel it's an honor for me. It's an honor that I get to be the person that cared enough about each one of those students to get them across that stage. I believe that anyone can be successful in life with just one person that showed them that they cared. They cared enough to show you that homework assignment that you just couldn't figure out, where typically their whole lives of, you know, these... Some, right. some then these, you just fail. You just fail. You just get an F, yeah. Some of these 50-year-old men have never had someone that just took the time to listen to the problem that they have and just think a little harder about how to help them. And for me, I really do feel blessed and honored to be that person for these students um, because they're changing their lives and they're supporting their families and they have so much ahead of them that, once again, the typical education system in a four-year college just wouldn't give them. Thank you for what you do. Tell everybody if they want to find out more about Forge Now, how they can do that. Please follow us on social media. We are on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn under Forge Now. They should be doing YouTube. We should be doing YouTube and maybe we can get some helpful tips and tricks from my friend Roger over here. Um, But we're also, you can go to www.forgenow.com and all of our program information is listed on that site and you can give one of our admissions counselors a call. Megan, thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate it.